this moment that we find ourselves in in New York State is a very exciting one as far as energy is concerned. Uh, as many of you know, we banned fracking in New York Woo! in December 2014 after a long, hard fight and literally thousands of New Yorkers across the state who participated in that movement. Many of the folks here tonight uh, were at rallies and petitioned and spent countless hours educating their neighbors and family about why fracking is so dangerous and why we didn't want it in our state. So that was a very big victory. So there's a lot of momentum towards uh, creating a renewable energy future, which we know is possible, the technology exists, and we just need to keep building the political will. Now at the same time that we have this incredible opportunity to transition New York State to renewable energy, and we banned fracking, which is awesome. Uh, the war is not won, not that I like using war metaphors at a Brooklyn for Peace event, but we have a lot of work to do. Uh, there's still pipelines that are popping up all over the place. The gas and oil industry did not just pack up and leave our state uh, when we banned fracking. They're, they're not throwing in the towel quite yet, uh, despite the resistance that's going on around the country and around the world. And so thankfully we have people like Kim um, and Sane Energy Project and many other organizations that are fighting these pipelines. Uh, and it's actually coined a new phrase, uh, keystoneization, which I just learned. I don't know if people have heard this, but uh, that stems from the fight against the Keystone Pipeline when I think thousands of people, including me, um, got arrested uh, down in DC and other places protesting the Keystone Pipeline. But that was just one pipeline, and there's many more where that came from, and it feels like every time I turn around, there's another pipeline. But just as there's another pipeline everywhere we look, there's another local group popping up to resist these pipelines, which is so exciting and wonderful to see that people are you know, not taking this line down. They know that they need to protect their communities from the fossil fuel industry and are organizing to win. Part of what I do is I, I work with art to help to organize people. And we made this, this giant banner, and I'll just run through um, what it says. It's the United States of fracking. We're united with the Dine and Hopi, whose ancestral lands and ancient buildings are threatened by earthquakes. We're united by the pipelines and poisons, by the feeling that we're losing everything. We're united with Minnesota and Wisconsin, where frac sand mining fills the air with toxic silica dust. We're united with parents in Butler, PA, whose kids go to school next to frac waste containment ponds. With West Virginia, where waste is dumped right into the creeks that feed the rivers that supply drinking water. With 9-11 first responders who move to Mini Sink to heal their lungs, only to find polluted by a compressor station. Port Ambrose, Cove Point, Coos Bay, where liquefied natural gas terminals are imposed through scamming our democracy, and may explode. We're united with everyone who wants a safe, permanent job, and not end a real home, not temporary employment residence in a man camp in the Dakotas. This is all very real. Oops. We're united with the heroes arrested for speaking out against fracking, and we're united with generations of those oppressed. And FERC is united with the oil and gas industry, and FERC is supposed to protect us, but they protect the industry. We're united with the stars that can no longer be seen because of blinding light from the gas flares. With the New York State, where explosive pipeline will pass dangerously close to Indian Point nuclear power plant. In California, where fracking continues in spite of the drought. But if we unite against oil and gas, we can be united by the air, the water, and the land we share. So these came from 50 phone calls that I had with people all over the United States to tell me their story. And then I worked with my favorite artist in the universe named Seth Tabachman, who's an amazing illustrator, to help me illustrate these stories. And what we did is we turned it into a giant 50-foot banner to use as a blockade at FERC. Um, so this is um, a group called Beyond Extreme Energy. Um, they're focused on fighting for, for the movement. A lot of them are based around Washington, D.C. So we traced Seth's drawings, and I brought it down to Washington, D.C., where we had the community paint it in and learn the story. So people felt much more tied to the, to the banner, and they, because we actually joined together in communion to make this piece of art. 
and then we blockaded FERC with it, and they couldn't go to work because they had to, they walked in and they had to face all the stories of the people who FERC is endangering. And right in that place where Port Amherst was vetoed, we have the opportunity to build offshore wind. We have a potential to build amazing power using our natural resources here in New York State. So I just want you guys to remember the way industry is seeing New York State and the way that we see New York State. And this is a real future that we can build. And I'll leave it at that. We, we've all been anti-fracking, but is the real fight anti-gas? Anti-any gas, like we should not be- Anti-fossil fuels. Yeah, anti- And nuclear. Anti-extractive energy. Yeah. Nuclear is extractive energy. Um, you know, fossil fuels are extractive energy. We, you know, we've watched, I mean, life on this planet has is, is coexisted in, in harmony way before we were even here with the power of the sun. I, I mean, there's ways to do it. We, we can do it. Is this an opportunity that price is falling to make alliances with the workers in the industry? I think this is very much so. This was Naomi Klein's message in Paris as well. Uh, she, you know, she was referring to the Alberta tar sands where 60,000 workers have lost their job in the province, not just on the tar sands, but there's so many knock-on, induced and um, uh, secondary jobs related to the tar sands. And the same is true in, in the US as well, because the, even if we look, I just get, even if we take away from the uh, statistics of the latest price pool, if we look at coal in the United States, in 1945 there were something like 350,000 coal miners, and they were nearly all of them were in a union. And now there's about 70,000, of which 10% are in a union if they're lucky. And the average coal miner produces more coal uh, now than. Uh, let me rephrase that. More coal is produced in the United States today than was produced in 1945. So the actual capital, in cap, it's capital intensive, it's no longer traditional coal mining, it's blasting. Uh, so, but in the, you know, in terms of the frack in gas and in tar sands, there's been, workers have been expunged from the whole fossil fuel sector. And, um, and then, yes, I think this is a chance, time to say, you know, uh, let's, let's have a turn in direction. I just uh, did a piece, I uh, did promotional, self-promotional here called Labour After Keystone Excel, which is coming out in about a month in New Labour Forum. It says, this is a chance now for the labour movement to finally dump its alliance with the American petroleum industry. The building trades have got literally an on paper, signed with blood, alliance with the petroleum industry to promote uh, North American fossil fuels. And those workers are now with the Keystone defeat. There are many in the building trades who are fighting for a different direction. So I think there's a, there's a good opening there, definitely. Let, let, me, let me just give an example from the trade union discussions at the global level. At around about 2006, 2007, all union leaders started talking about green growth, green and inclusive growth. We need green growth. And that term comes from the World Bank. They didn't know that. They'd just been basically, that was the dominant sort of language everybody's using it, policy makers are using it, elected officials are using it. Those are the good guys, let alone the, you know, the fossil fuel guys, the carbon criminals, they're using a completely different language. So I think all, I, all my suggestion would be that we should all just be careful about what words we use and where did it come from and what agenda is being served or, or maybe it's not an agenda, but I think having that kind of more uh, critical approach to formulations I've heard people talk about, we need to tax carbon. I've seen everybody's heads <laughs> nod. It's like, well, what's that, what does that actually mean? You know, we could have a whole discussion on taxing carbon. Are, are we going to be, if the tax is then passed on to the consumer, which are mostly working class people, then who's getting taxed? The polluter pays principle. It's the worker pays principle often. Because if the polluter has to pay, then that gets passed on. And in the end, we don't get to the fundamental problem of who owns and controls energy, resources, infrastructure, and options. And I think that's got to be the, what the, the heart of the energy democracy debate is we've got to go after that in a big, big way. Not in a slogan, slogan way, but in a way that says, this is a future we can build 
these, this is, yes, these are the terms and language we can use to inspire people. But I think using terms like stranded assets, just my view, like, can have a misleading like effect. Uh, <laughs> Sean, I appreciated what you were saying about the analogy to the rapid electrification of this country. Um, that happened in the context of labor unrest and mass exercise of sabotage power on the economy, unlike anything we've seen since. And uh, I wonder, from your dual perspective, do you see pathways towards momentum on that scale uh, in either the labor movement or in the environmental movement? I think there's a lot of overlap in terms of engaging workers. How do we do that? My, my sense is that you mentioned just transition in, uh, in front of a union. The idea of just transition is that workers should not have to suffer a disproportionate burden for environmental or climate policy. That it, the burden should be uh, the, the opportunity should, should be shared and, and the risks and the burden should be shared. That's the kind of the idea. But just because you work in fossil fuels doesn't mean to say you're the one who gets thrown under the decarbonized truck, right? So I think they, so how do we engage uh, unions on this? So many unions understand that, that the, way the, the way the political system is rigged and way the, the power of the fossil fuel companies, that they've made a pact with the devil even though they know it's the devil because they don't have any confidence that the liberal policy architecture that's being proposed is actually going to deliver anything resembling a just transition for them. Of course, you can point to the fact, well, you know, you're being thrown out of jobs because of the collapse in the prices, true. But when a job comes along, like building a pipeline, and you've got members, you know, basically screaming, probably wearing Donald Trump bumper stickers that they want to build that pipeline, a union leader in that business often won't last more than five minutes unless they try to sign a project labor agreement with the company to do it. They often argue, and have argued in front of me and many other people, I'm sure, in this room, that if we don't build it, someone else is going to build it. It's inevitable. We can't stop it. This was the argument with the Keystone Pipeline. So I think, but engaging on the, um, it's not easy, but I would say that there are many other workers now in healthcare and transport in particular who are, who are taking up climate fights and are putting up with a lot of abuse from the building trades. Uh, I don't have time to go into details, but there's, there's a war going on. Labor is a carbon battleground. And this is true not just in the US but elsewhere. And to engage workers in the industry, I think, is only on the basis of having an alternative. And this is where democratic control of energy making sure that, let's say, re uh, new public authorities doing municipal renewable power, hire union, work union, invite unions into the policy design phase, get workers' organizations in at the very beginning. And I think that will go some way towards neutralizing the opposition. It may not solve all the problems. So I'll just transition into the, uh, the question of, uh, uh, is it Patrick? Was it Patrick? Is that you, Patrick? Yeah. On the, you know, yes, the context of the New Deal, of course, was an economic depression and a rising movement. But it was interesting that the, um, and I, th I think we're in, that there's signs that we're in a similar period. We don't have the levels of economic hardship that we had in the 30s. We don't have the levels of unemployment. But we certainly have volatility at the level of politics that I don't think anybody, I certainly haven't seen in my 30 years living in the United States. I haven't seen it like a Bernie Sanders versus Trump phenomenon happening. I just haven't seen it. Where a guy gets up and he talks about socialism and, and you know, literally millions of young people in particular are voting for the guy. Um, I you know, don't want to exaggerate it, but this is, a, this is an opportunity, I think, to build a movement. Climate on its own, energy won't build a movement on its own, but it has to be part of a program, a vision of a different society and a different future. And, so I do feel that um, if I think the electoral space is very important, I don't. I think it's very difficult at the national level. Yes, but I think it, with city and state level, I think left wing, whether they're, I would like to think they were independent of both the main parties, could implement policies at the state level to really radically scale up renewable energy in the public sphere, publicly owned. I think that's a possibility. It won't overthrow capitalism. But it will do a lot to build confidence in workers' organizations, in community power, in the same way as we take the struggle to them. And I think that's uh, um, important. The American Federation of Labor in 1932 approached 
uh, the Roosevelt administration when he was first elected and said, we want to do this in the public sector, public goods and public work schemes. And this was, this was like, the AFL was a pretty backward organization then, just as backward now as you might say. But, but you know, the, what was interesting about that whole discourse was that when FDR, when the Rural Electrification Administration started, they said, well, we can either do private contractors or we can do it in-house, which is the best way of doing it. And they said, we'll do it in-house. And the Tennessee Valley Authority was the first place where public sector unions were actually organized in the United States. The door was open for them. So these are the kind of thing, unions in the trades, they want to see big scale stuff. That's why they like centralized as opposed to decentralized. Doesn't mean to say per se there's anything particularly bad in my view about centralized under some circumstances we may need it. Uh, but what, the reason why unions like centralized because it usually means an employer and it usually means an agreement, whereas decentralized is residential, it's often non-union, it's some kind of liquid, some cowboy kind of installer with some middleman doing the financing. And before you know it, there's no room for unions in that scenario or workers. I mean, there's no room even for communities to some extent. So I think the lesson of Germany of saying, enough of this, let's go into the re-municipalization, take back the grids for private companies is really important. I don't know if I've dealt with everything, but I, Steve's question, if I may, one more minute, would that be all right? Please. Um, you know, I think the hard and the hard, this ties into the hard energy democracy. You know, I'd like to see a day when a president of the United States will stand up and say, given the assault on our atmosphere by the fossil fuel companies and the assault on people, the millions of people around the world who are dying, and the thousands, tens of thousands of people are dying through um, uh, illnesses related to fossil fuels, I am passing through an, an executive order by using my executive authority to immediately freeze the assets of all the fossil, major fossil fuel corporations. Right? Now, how many people would come out in the streets protesting that move? You might get some. And there may be all sorts of legalities involved around the Constitution. But my interpretation of the, my interpretation of the Constitution is says, without just cause. Well, I think there is a just cause. And a, and a, you know, a brave uh, party, a movement, a leader, whatever is pushed forward from that movement, should use all sorts of powers available to them. This is, I think, possible. And I would definitely go after the fossil fuel companies, seizing their assets is a good place to start. And then, of course, um, financing public renewable power, using pension funds that unions have got through the guaranteed rate of return, which wouldn't need to be very high given today's interest rates. It's possible to do that and to go big with it because the scale that we need to be at in renewable power, look at renewable power in the United States. What is it as a percentage of power generation? Does anybody know? Take hydro out of the picture, what have we got? 2%? Yeah, 2%? It's 75% fossil fuel, 90% a 20% nuclear, a 6 or 7% big hydro, and 1 or 2% wind and solar? Yeah. That's not going to get us to well below 2 degrees if the United States is going to play its role, which it should do, given that 28% of emissions in the atmosphere came from 5% of the world's population, the United States. I'm not talking about annual emissions, I'm talking about cumulative emissions, which is warming the planet now. We need that level of ambition, and that's the only way I think we're going to do it, is go straight after the culprits, scale up renewable power in the public sector, bring communities and municipalities in, bring you know, representatives of, the, of, the, of those organizations in uh, to the transition. And when Bernie Sanders says, we need to accelerate the transition to clean and renewable energy, but then he puts forward incremental steps. We're not, he's not doing, you know, we need to be talking to every Bernie Sanders supporter and saying, we like what Bernie's saying about climate change. We like what he's saying about taking on the fossil fuel companies, but we really need to do some work on this energy transition idea because a few little tax breaks for a few little solar companies is not going to get us where we need to go. Are, are people really going to maybe try to uh, do something about the subsidies 
that are given to fossil fuel um, companies, and, and do you think that that can hopefully, uh, what extent of a role would that play in, in shifting towards uh, more renewable energy sources? Just, let's say if they remo remove the entire uh, subsidies that are provided to the, to the fossil fuel, and, and you know, just to, to make some kind of argument as to why is that even happening, and how is that okay? I mean, that's a significant, I mean, you know, I'm paying to go to school, and yet they're getting free money to do this. I don't think it's fair, so what do you think? <laughs> sure. Uh, I, you know, it's a it's an estimated IMF figure is 500 billion a year annually globally for fossil fuel uh, companies. Take that off. I don't know what effect it would have. I'm I'm sure that's a lot of money. Uh, what the and I'm not playing devil's advocate here, but what fossil fuel companies say is per unit of energy produced, they're far far less subsidized than renewable energy, which is actually true. But that, who cares? I mean, that's not the point. Um, I don't know the economic in, impact of, of what it will be. Um, but it's clearly, it's an important demand, and I think it's one that we should, we should take up without any illusions, though, that 500 billion, the, the, I think one of the issues around the divestment movement as well is there's a, a bit of a myth that if, you, if money goes out of fossil fuels in the form of investment, it's going to end up in renewable energy. That's not true. What's happening globally, and you see this in, in the European Union, money is flying out of the energy system. Because the value of the utilities in Europe, mostly driven by fossil fuels, has gone down by a trillion euros, right? So it's now half of where it was um, uh, 10 years ago. But that doesn't mean that trillion euros that flew out of there is running into renewable energy. It's just big institutional investors, they go wherever they can make money. So they're not going to say, oh, no, we better do renewables now. No, what's happening is investment's flying out of renewables as well. So investment in renewable power in the European, European Union, because of the failure of the carbon market, has gone down by about 50 billion euros from 2012 to 2015 a year. So it's now gone down three years in a row. And so both sides of the energy um, system, if you like, the fossil and the renewable is in a crisis. And the same true is happening, the same is happening in the United States. People getting out of fossil fuels because of the low prices, low profitability, aging infrastructure, the coal power plants are really old, the nuclear old are getting old. Um, this means that investors are not going anywhere near it, and companies are basically going out of business or going somewhere else. This doesn't help renewables. Okay, can I just say something about oh, oh, subsidies first? That war is the biggest subsidy for the fossil fuel system. If we have to get rid of war, the fossil fuel system will be out of business. For those of you who were around in the 19, late 1970s in Long Island, there was a desire to build a nuclear power plant in a place called Shoreham. Um, that was advanced by a private utility company called Lilco. Uh, many of us were very involved in that struggle. I'm sitting next to a guy who was involved. And what we decided the way to stop Wilco was to municipalize um, the Long Island power distribution. And by the way, that worked. There is no nuclear power plant that has ever operated in Chorum. They ran the tests, but they never got the power plant up and running. So the answer is yes, there is a way that you can use municipalization to actually have some control over your energy. And the story of LIPA, the Long Island you know, Power Authority, um, is a good one that lets us know that the struggle is never over. That intersectional <laughs> organizing is very important. We're all overlapping in energy justice is, is one part that I think a lot of places overlap in because it's so connected to war, it's so connected to our food system. It keeps us from building efficiently where we can curb our consumption, to his question point. Um, I mean, there, there is a way to build another system. I, um, we all just have to participate in that and, and actually hit the streets.